Hi and welcome to my talk. My name is Marc Opreville and I'm a professor at THI Technische Hochschule Ingolstadt or in English the University of Applied Sciences in Ingolstadt, Germany. Um, my talk today will be about large-scale datasets for AI, so for artificial intelligence, um, and the question of how to achieve quantity and quality. So let's get right into it. First of all, let's have a look at the outline of my talk. So first I will be answering the question why or if we have the need for large-scale datasets. Then we will follow up with the question how to create those large-scale datasets. And finally, we will come to the question of how to use and also how to validate those large-scale datasets. So let's start right at the top. Now, when we started with creating large-scale datasets for microscopy images, um, we had a very interesting discussion with our medical partners. That was, for instance, Robert Klopfleisch from FU Berlin, from the veterinary pathology there, and he said, well, you know, if we want to achieve something like with really good results, um, how much data do you need from us? And I told him, oh, well, that depends on how good it needs to be and how complicated the problem is. So the question that we always have to answer is like, how much data is actually enough and how does it relate to gains in performance? Second question is of course very related to that and is how much time do we actually need to invest for that? And the third question is maybe can we even leverage unannotated data? So maybe that's possible. Um, let's dive right into that and let's dive into the first question. So um, in principle, um, there has been, I think, a large scientific consensus that it is actually very meaningful to have large-scale data sets, especially with those deep um, architectures that we are using nowadays. And um, now, just as a reference here, um, if we have a look at the recognition performance, in this case the top one accuracy on the ImageNet dataset, and we compare this to the number of parameters in millions, then we can see that, yes, there is a relation um, between that and um, we can see that the performance scales with network capacity. And of course, network capacity is, at least for like back-end solutions nowadays, not a big problem anymore. Um, now, the question is, does using deep learning performance also scale with data? And for that, maybe we have to look for someplace else because the ImageNet dataset, which is actually the de facto standard, the benchmark dataset, um, containing roughly 14.2 million images of 20,000 categories, I'm so sorry. Um, but there's another dataset that is unfortunately not publicly available, um, which is the JFT300 dataset from Google. And this dataset scales up and is uh, featuring some 300 million data points or images of 18,000, I think, yeah, 18,000 categories. Now, that's of course a whole lot more. And the question that the guys from Google tried to answer with their paper is, does the performance, the recognition performance, also scale up with that data set size? And they found, yes, in fact, it does. So, of course, this is no secret nowadays, and it's also true not only for this domain. Um, when we look a little bit further and look into um, text-to-image conversion, something which has become very popular in the recent days with the large diffusion, diffusion models, um, and we can see that, for example, we can now query a model, something like vibrant portray painting of Salvador Dali with robotic, robotic half-face, and we then get a picture like this. So this is courtesy of Dali 2. Um, then, um, or for example, um, as another example, we can also say, oh yeah, a marble statue of a koala DJ in front of a marble statue of a turntable. The koala is wearing large marble headphones and this is one of the prime examples of image gen of the Google team. So we can see that there's quite something happening here and all of this depends on large scale data sets. And as a fun fact, also um, all the drawings that I have in my presentation were generated by a really smaller version of DALI called DALI Mini, which you can find on the internet nowadays. So, um, 
even those, uh, oops, those here uh, up here in the corner, um, those are also um, generated by this um, yeah, text to image engine. Now, uh, the work, uh, the domain that I work in most of the time is the domain of histopathology. And in particular, we are or were in the past also mostly interested in mitotic figures. So mitotic figures are, for example, in this image this year. So that's a cell that is dividing at the moment. Um, now, the problem is not only with detecting those, but also the problem for the pathologic process is that there is really so many of them in such a typical large microscopy image. Now you can see them all um, shown in green. So if that's um, a problem for the diagnostic process, so basically the question is, where are those metodic figures? How many of them are there? What is their density? Which is then, of course, important in order to see, well, how much cell division is going on. So how much is the tumor growing at the moment? Um, and um, um, if we want to do this and detect this, then of course we are back to the question, now how much time do we need to invest to annotate this? Well, luckily, um, I had a hard-working bunch of people there um, sitting in Berlin and who did a lot of annotations for us. So we were able to find out how the um, detection performance scales with the dataset size. So um, going that back to that, um, um, so what did we do different? So in previous datasets, only a fraction of the image was annotated. So for instance, the fraction could look like this. And the whole different or the whole rest of the image was not annotated. So we went through the pain of, of doing that, also doing that with a second annotator, also with a third if they didn't agree, um, also to aid that with some machine learning in order to find all the possible candidates. And we then found um, that, of course, well, this of course scales up uh, tremendously the effort that you put into the annotation. So. In this case, we scaled it up by around 60 to 80 percent. Well, luckily, we really had some some crazy scientists um, sitting in Berlin who were keen on finding that out together with us. Um, but we also found that um, the effect that this has, like only the annotation size on such a microscopy slide, is also tremendous. Now, when we first ran our experiments and we limited this, like we limited what we trained our models upon to the usual size, 10 high power fields, that is approximately two square millimeters. Then we found that the recognition performance was very similar to what you can find as the state of the art, like in literature. So that was in this case. So this was the highest score that we had previously seen on uh, the largest previously available data set, which was back then the Tupac 16 data set from Mit Goveda and his colleagues. And um, yeah. So what does that um, mean for our experiment? So we, of course, try to scale it also down. Um, how much does the model deteriorate if we only have half of that size um, in the same like high hotspot regions, of course, which we also carefully selected, or if we have like five times the size or the complete slide. And then we found out that this scales tremendously um, up to a point where we have an F1 score of 0.82, round about that, depending a bit on the tumor type. So. Um, that made us very happy because, um, after, as we later found out, the human recognition performance is actually in the same range. Um, so the human recognition performance is actually also, um, for good performing pathologists, also in the range of 0.8. So yes, uh, we had some quite good job done with the big data set here. Um, which uh, one thing that we also investigated is how does that scale with the number of cases, which you can see here on the right hand side of the slide. So if you can see here, if we have three WSI, if we have six WSI, if we have 12 WSI, so whole slide images, or if we have all 21, it's not a lot, but I mean, 21 takes a lot to annotate. Um, then we see that the scaling really um, saturated more quickly. So it was all about the area of annotation, um, also all of, about like having a different mixture of tissue qualities in there um, and also like necrosis and all of these kinds of things that make annotation really hard. So to really show the full variability um, of that to the model and that helped um, tremendously. All right, so um, let's summarize that briefly. 
So first of all, yes, more training data leads to better coverage of the input space, right? So um, we can then run better models on that. Secondly, the saturation in performance depends on the data ambiguity. So that means um, uh, if we have data that is very easy and non-ambiguous, then of course we do not need a lot of training data. And the more diverse the data gets and the more ambiguous it also gets, the more data we will uh, have to have required for a good performance. And finally, um, with today's high capacity and deep learning models, there isn't such a thing as too much data. Quite easy. Now, let's move on and go to the interesting question of how to create those large scale data sets and maybe also some things that we learned along the way. So the interesting question that you ask yourself at first is how do I find the proper annotation tool? Now what we did is what maybe a lot of computer scientists will do, they write their own annotation tools. But you don't need to do that, of course. So there's plenty of annotation tools out there, which I will come to in a minute. Um, the other question that you could ask yourself is, can some student do the job? Well, also that um, is, of course, a very yeah, reasonable question, um, because, of course, it tremendously scales the effort that you have to put into for your highly paid experts. And finally, um, well, how many annotators do we then actually need? To add that up, can maybe an algorithm even help us in the annotation? So let's dive into all of those four questions now. Starting off with how do I find the proper annotation tool? As I said, um, we went through the um, effort of creating our own that was then specifically tailored to like single click annotations to um, really efficiently annotate cells. But as you can see here um, in the, uh, on the slide, there's so many different um, um, so many different annotation tools that all work well. Um, of course, we have um, local tools like IC QPass, also our slide runner, or web-based like Cytomine or our exact tool. And I think all of them, they serve as a slightly different purpose best, um, but all of them can be really applied for annotation in general. Well, depends on the task that you're doing and the, and, and the annotation workflow that you have, which one of the tools will really be the best one. Um, also, notably, um, nowadays, we also have synchronization between local and web-based um, installations, such as like for Cytomine and IC, there is iCytomine, uh, and also for the synchronization between SlideRunner and Exact, um, this is built in over a REST API interface that was designed for this. Okay, so now that we have answered this question, let's come to the next question, which is maybe more tricky one. So, um, the question is, can't some students do the job? Well, as I said, it's a very reasonable question to ask this because, I mean, students are not stupid, <laughs> obviously, they're students. Um, maybe they have not learned everything right now and they have a lack of experience in some domains, but for certain tasks, it's really reasonable to say, maybe we can also train some students to do the job and maybe um, it's much easier to scale the work with them, right? Because they are looking for a student job or whatever else. So um, I dug into the literature for that a little bit and um, found comparisons of like expert annotations, um, novice annotations, so student annotations and intermediate, which were usually residents. Um, and we found that, for example, for cytology cancer type, there was a study by Warren and colleagues in 20, 2019, um, which showed that actually there was little difference between novices and experts. Now, moving to other tasks, cytology cell identification was also fairly good um, in terms of quality. We also have colon cancer type detection, uh, but we already saw um, a little drop off. Maybe that also had to do with the study design. Um, and then we also have um, like more complicated tasks like writing a pathology report um, or um, uh, writing a complete breast cancer diagnosis. So we can see that the more complicated the task gets, um, the more experience is required and the less, of course, um, it can be done by something that it's somebody that has little experience in that job. Well, so um, coming to the next question. So how many annotators do we need actually? 
And of course, medical experts are expensive. And of course, we are really fortunate that we are living in a world where we have so good research collaborators that they put all this effort into in it for free for us. So that's quite fortunate for us. Um, but of course, still, um, we know and we value their resources. And so um, we said, um, it's interesting to just see, so how many experts do you actually need? Let's, um, and since we didn't want to do this experiment with our actual experts, we run a little simulation. And the simulation is that we have three raters. Um, there is a ground truth for that, uh, for that experiment. And all of those raters, they deviate randomly from the ground truth by a certain percentage. I think it was 10% or something like that uh, initially. And um, depending on that percentage, um, also the raters in between will have a different kind of inter-rater disagreement. So the inter-rater disagreement is typically measured using Fly's kappa value. Um, and so uh, that means that we running this experiment, we are in the, uh, now able to um, set into context the Fly's kappa value with the actual accuracy that we receive for the annotation. So let's do that now. As I said, it's of course a simulation. So um, of course, we in this case, we assumed um, the raters to be all independent, all, also independent from the case, which is of course a non-realistic um, assumption. Um, but if we look into that, then we can see that for a kappa value of above 0.6, um, which is considered or termed substantial agreement, um, we are at an accuracy level of 0.94. Now, or a bit above 0.94. Now, you could say that 0.94 is already sufficient. And that, of course, depends on the task again. On the other hand, you could also say that, well, for other tasks, we will have to have a um, better agreement. Um, um, so also the um, um, accuracy that we get, maybe this is one thing that I missed to say now, the accuracy that we will get um, at a majority vote of the experts, um, that's depicted here, um, um, will then of course be better. Now we can in this ideal simulation world also include more um, of the annotators, right? So um, luckily these simulated annotators are really affordable for us. Um, they only consume like a couple of CPU cycles. Um, and um, if we now do a majority vote of, let's say not three, but five of them, we can see also the effect that this has. So keeping constant the value of kappa, um, we can see um, how that um, re relates to a different accuracy if we have a five person um, um, majority vote. So let's look into these results now, which are now depicted in orange, and we can see that we have a strong increase in accuracy. Well, not surprisingly, of course. Um, and now we have even for a kappa value of around about a bit above 0.6, so what is, which is just uh, in the order of substantial agreement, um, which we already have a, a accuracy of 0.98, which is already a lot better, right? So the error has dropped and um, dropped by 50%. So um, we have a higher accuracy for the same agreement level with this. Cool. Now, the interesting question that we could um, also ask here is something that, um, um, yeah, Frauke Wilm, one of my PhD students, looked into in more detail. So the question that she asked is, so how does this affect training of a deep learning model? And we actually ran this experiment um, on some study data that we had. Um, and here we had 11 annotators and we um, were able to either randomly choose them, um, which is here the pink color, or we were able to choose the highest one with the highest agreement to our ground truth um, or the one with the lowest agreement to our ground truth. And uh, we can see that if we only have one annotator, of course, that um, the lower agreement to the ground truth significantly impacts the F1 score on the model. And once we add, uh, enhance that number to, well, three, because two doesn't make sense for a majority vote uh, in a kind of binary case, right? Um, so once we increase that number to three, uh, then we already see that the performance goes up quite significantly. And we have no such strong effects uh, following this thereafter. So five and seven and nine uh, does not improve the stability a lot um, of our trained deep learning model. 
Okay, so um, um, let's dig a little bit deeper into that. And for that, we did another experiment. Um, so we said now, okay, this was on mitotic figure annotation, um, the task that I previously presented to you. Um, and we now ask ourselves, so, um, well, if we have those annotators, like how easily can they be fooled by using um, a prediction, maybe in a computer assisted annotation way that is biased. And for that, um, we said that we, well, most likely the following kind of errors occurred during some kind of annotation process. First of all, we have like wrong class assignment. So we have maybe multiple classes and then we have actually um, only um, because of maybe a kind of um, error in the handling of the program or maybe um, just because of, um, yeah, um, simple human error, um, we have a wrong class assignment. And then we also have missing annotations where just like such a bounding box is missing. And we also have misaligned annotations where the bounding box is not completely right. So let's disentangle those. And with this, um, we want to dig into the question of can an algorithm help us in the annotation? So um, first things first. So the wrong class assignment is, well, of course, a source of actual disagreement. And if we have some cells that are really a little bit more ambiguous, then we will naturally have such a kind of um, disagreement there. And this is a really a case where we need multiple raters in order to reduce the error um, to a, a level that is okay. And then we have the missing and misaligned annotations. And this is actually mainly a concentration issue from my point of view. So this is something that you can clearly, when you revisit those annotations, see that there is an error in there. So this can be really supported by some machine learning algorithm um, with an actual low risk of really inducing a bias here. Because if we were to predict like a wrong box here that is not fitting, then this is really easy to detect for uh, the human annotator. Okay, so um, we did some experiments here again, and here I'm again citing a paper of ours, um, which was um, published on Mikai in 2020. Um, and here we said, okay, let's let's try to to see how easily our our human experts fooled um, by um, just well an annotation experiment where we said, okay, so we have here um, an algorithm that produced those results, and you need to check them. So that was our our um, research question that we posed to our participants. Um, the participants were all pathology experts, um, which all knew the task very well. So um, in this case, we were also saying, okay, please let us find mitotic figures. And when we did that, then we found that, well, for example, if we have those uh, three ground truth mitotic figures and we showed them those, those detections or like supposed to detections to our participants, then actually most of them agreed. So all of those icons are uh, individual participants of the experiment that agreed to, um, to this um, annotation and didn't change it in any other way. However, also if we um, chose to add cells that were non-mitotic figures, but looked a little bit similar, um, for example, these ones here, then also lots of our annotators agreed with that. So we can see that um, the more closely the objects that we annotate are related to um, um, the real object, the stronger we can induce some kind of bias. Now, this also uh, happens um, in the same case if we remove a ground truth annotation, which was in this case here. Um, and here this meant that um, actually, because we removed the annotation, only a minority of the annotators re-added it. Well, so we see that there's a significant risk of inducing bias in a kind of annotation experiment if the task is challenging enough. Now, another thing that we visited there, that we saw there actually, um, is that if we, um, so we didn't really remove those objects or add those like artificial objects uh, by total chance. But we had three groups that we um, had. So we had um, groups with high similarity to the real objects and with low similarity to the real objects. So we used some kind of classification approach for that. And we also found that the more similar those objects were to the real objects, um, the more easily were people um, biased by our fake annotation or by our 
um, or in the other way around, the, the more um, dissimilar they were, the easier it was um, that people didn't add those annotations back again in the task. Yeah, so that leaves us um, to a proposed framework that we can actually now say with all the knowledge that we gained in these experiments, this is how we would recommend to do it. So um, first of all, um, we see that actually finding those class indifferent um, bounding boxes of objects, of cell objects on microscopy images, is something where we can very easily aid with machine learning. So that tremendously reduces the time that we need for annotation. And then we take those cells um, that we now detected, or maybe also a human expert helped us in finding them and we just ran again um, an experiment to find the missing ones, um, then we can feed those to our experts. So that cuts down uh, on the cost of annotation while really not having a strong form of bias, right? So as I said, um, the bias is really um, only the question um, if we don't have any objects. And by the way, um, we were also always feeding negative objects into that. So not only the positive, in this case, the mitotic figures, but also similarly op looking objects, which we also fed into the classification task or selection task for our experts. So this splits up the whole annotation process into two, two parts and the one part can be really easily aided by machine learning and the other part um, from our point of view um, should be really dealt with a lot of care when using some machine learning to um, help here. So we tried that also out and um, used that in the annotation of some of our data sets. Um, this one is from our paper um, where we relabeled the 2 pack 16 data set because we thought that there is some headroom in it in terms of label quality um, and where we showed that this um, actually then also increased the consistency of the data set um, by quite some bit. Um, so the idea is here that we will have an expert, um, the expert screened um, the image for such cells, so either mitotic figures or similar looking cells. Um, we also had a machine learning algorithm run on that to find more of those cells that would have been overlooked previously. And then we would have uh, these fed to two experts um, and um, in a blind way assigned classes. If they agreed, then it's fine. And if not, then you can either go for like a consensus of those, the, those experts or you go for a third expert as the final vote. So that leads me to a summary of this part of my talk. Um, so first of all, the assessment of the inter-rater concordance is really essential. Um, we need to do that actually before running the experiment. Um, the annotation tasks can be split up to achieve higher quality labels, so into things that can be aided by machine learning without inducing bias and those where we should uh, restrain from doing that or at least um, do a um, proper quality check of the annotations in an unbiased way afterwards. Um, and of course, not surprisingly, uh, the label quality affects the model quality well. So that leads me to the third and final part of my presentation. How do we validate on those large scale data sets? And um, coming to that, um, um, we have to state that especially in medical recommender systems, validation is a key to trust, right? So we need really a representative data set. Um, and without that, we cannot really validate our systems. So as I said, um, the validation needs to be run on a representative holdout set, um, which is else indispensable. So um, we know that having openly accessible data sets really fueled algorithm development. This is true for ImageNet. This is also true um, for uh, many biomedical tasks. Um, however, this also means that um, these have to be dealt with a lot of ca caution when used for validation. Now, let's have a look again to back to our ImageNet dataset. Now, of course, the recognition of ImageNet continued um, over the years. And if we compare that now up to the 2020, um, we can see that now here it's in this case top five accuracy depicted um, steadily increased up to, let's say, around 100 percent nowadays, 99 percent. And we could really ask ourselves now, um, does that really mean that the models just became this good? Or does it mean that the availability of some kind of knowledge about the test set helped to, well, to fuel basically um, a kind of 
ja, Model Competition, where Models um, were the top runners um, that were just very good at recognizing stuff from, from, this particularly data, uh, from this particular data set and not from a general use case. So this is a thing um, that means openly accessible data sets really need to be treated with caution for the, uh, when they should be used for validation. Okay, um, yeah, because if they are available, then they allow the fine tuning of hyperparameters on the test set. And this is of course, not a good thing in terms of being representative. Also, they drive a survivorship bias towards actually lucky shots on the test set, right? So we don't, we will never know which of those are real algorithmic advancements and which of those are just some kind of lucky shots, which can also then happen, even though we are on a really big data set. Now, um, one thing that we propose and that we think could really help this in the biomedical sense is that we should aim together as a community for a study register for machine learning experiments. And the reason for that is that the more often you can run an experiment on the test set, the higher um, the chance of just doing a hyperparameter optimization on your test set and, and which is actually then again an overfit on your test set. So. The idea is as follows. Um, typically, our al algorithm developers, they build a data set, right? So they construct an algorithm, but also as in many like biomedical challenges, at least, they write some kind of report or paper about it. And this is in this kind of idea, um, the precondition in order to run the algorithm on some kind of test set, because you will have some kind of review committee um, not with in-depth uh, like reviews, but just to see if this is a sensible approach and um, it's, if it's worth to be run on a set, right? So if it's just like, okay, we tried it again um, with, a, with a kind of different hyperparameters or if it's really, okay, we have a different approach and this is the reason why we think that this approach will work better and this is why we want to evaluate now. Actually, this is how you do it with every medical study, right? In order to get clearance for that, you have to sign up to a study register where you describe what you do and why you do it. And this is actually, um, at the moment, still foreign to um, machine learning, uh, to the machine learning community. Basically, our test sets are oftentimes available, like for automatic evaluation nowadays, um, so we can run many, many models and uh, the best one does, is not necessarily the really the best one for the task, but just for this test set. So um, in this scenario, the review committee will then enable the evaluation on some kind of um, validation set and this will be also communicated very transparently um, to everyone. So all of the approaches can be seen um, with full name of the authors. Um, and this will, in my opinion, also um, reduce the incentives for just trying to overfit on the test data. All right, so let's summarize that third point also briefly. Um, so trust requires transparency in the evaluation of algorithms. I think this is a very clear thing. Further, the survivorship or publication bias is a severe problem at the moment in machine learning. There's every now and then papers claiming, yet we are again a half a percentage point better. That doesn't mean that they are actually better on the task. That just, just means that they were actually better on the test set. And maybe they even had the test set in their own hands. So maybe it was just a hyperparameter tuning that they did. And third, like a public registry for those experiments in machine learning would encourage hypothesis driven testing. All right, so let's come to my summary and conclusion of this talk, um, which is as the following. So first of all, large scale data sets are required for both training and validation of AI models. Second, annotations can be done algorithm aided, but they need to be really dealt with care when doing so. So you have to have at least some kind of holdout validation set that you didn't do um, in, an, in this like algorithm aided way, because else you could just cannot find out about potential biases that you induced while running the algorithms in the annotation loop. And finally, um, I think that we have to work on like study registers for uh, in order to achieve trustworthy algorithms in our field. So that's my talk. I hope you found it interesting. 
Um, thanks for your attention. And as I said, all of those uh, nice little models have been generated also with a model. Uh, in this case, it was Dali Mini. So all props go to those guys for, for doing this magnific magnificent stuff. And now, um, yeah, thanks for your attention and see you next time.